Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Hurry, come and help me now. Please rescue me immediately. Come quickly to my aid. It will come in time. You just have to wait. It will happen when the time is right. Could you hold for a moment? Cue the elevator music. We've all heard these phrases at different times in our life. and They all share one thing in common. They denote a sense of time. The first few that I spoke were immediacy. Come and assist me right away. I need your help, right? We say those when we're trying to give somebody else the same sense of urgency we already feel ourselves. And then the second half are those frustrating things that people tell you when you want to do something right away and they're like, hold on, it'll happen when it's supposed to happen. Which usually leads to maybe an eye roll or just like, oh, fine. But all these phrases denote a sense of time. And you would think there are certain times, there are real emergencies where you can't wait, right? Right? Times when we want healing for a loved one who's battling a terrible disease. Or maybe there's been a horrible accident. Come immediately, rescue us immediately. But the text today teaches us a different story. It teaches us a different reality, a reality where God is involved. Our text tells us means that we never have an absolute sense of of urgency. So first, let's set up this account from our gospel reading. The words in the Greek and in the English indicate a sense of time, right? We have Jairus who shows up in front of Jesus. He is a man of note, a ruler of the synagogue. But he is in a state of urgency. And so he falls on his face, he prostrates himself before Jesus, which is a very significant thing for someone of his standing to do. And the text says that he earnestly implores Jesus. And when we find out why, it makes total sense to us. His little girl is nearing death. If there's anything that denotes a sense of urgency, it would have to be that. So we understand. All of a sudden, the words in the text make sense. And we're right there next to Jairus saying, yeah, come on, Jesus, hurry up, go with him. And it looks like Jairus is going to get his way at first, right? Because right in the next verse it says, and he went with him. So Jesus follows after him. But something strange happens on the way. And this something strange communicates to us that Jesus really never has the same sense of urgency as Jairus does. Because you would think, no matter what's going to happen, nothing could possibly be more important to Jesus than rescuing this young girl from her impending death. And yet, something strange occurs. So as they're going, the text tells us that there's a great crowd of people that are already there. And when Jesus starts to walk, they all walk with him. And it says they're thronging about him. Right? Words gotten out. Jesus can do some incredible things. And people want to see him. They want to touch him. They want to hear his words and receive these miracles of healing. And there's one woman who is among that great crowd that's thronging about Jesus. And she has faith that if she just but touches his garment, he can heal her. And I love how they set up this woman because I'm sure there are people that can relate to this. It says that she has gone to all these different physicians to heal her of her ailment to no avail. She spent everything she has. This is her last hope. is Jesus. And the incredible thing is that Jesus responds even though this is the last place she looks. She's tried everything else. She's desperate, and she believes that Jesus is going to heal her. 
But then Je- Jesus does something odd, odd for a couple of reasons. One, his disciples voice for us. He turns around and he feels that power has gone out from him and he turns around among this great crowd of people who are all thronging about him, presumably touching him, and he says, who touched me? And his disciples are like, are you serious? There's a bunch of people around. They're all touching you. What do you mean, who touched me? But the other thing that's odd is Jesus is on his way, remember, to save a young 12-year-old girl from dying. And yet, he stops in the midst of this crowd and says, who touched me? And he doesn't go searching amidst the crowd for the person, because don't you think Jesus knows who it was? But he waits until the woman who has realized what has occurred to her comes before him in fear and trembling and confesses the whole truth. Surely Jesus will then say, okay, let's get back to our task here. But even then he does not. He takes the time to teach the woman what's really happened to her. You see, the woman was coming to Jesus thinking that he's going to just heal her of this ailment that has been bugging her for 12 years and getting worse and worse. And if you know anything about the cleanliness laws of that time, because of this ailment, she would have been shunned and basically thought to have been perpetually unclean. So ostracized on top of the pain and suffering. And notice the language when she approaches Jesus. It's clear she's not approaching someone who just healed her of her bodily ailment. It says, in fear and trembling, she fell on her face before him. She knows who this is now. He's not just some man who works healing through the gracious gift of God, but he is the Lord of Israel himself. And the Greek, the English translation of what Jesus then says to her is a bit confusing. The Greek has a better sense. In the English it says, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. In the Greek, the more accurate translation would be, Daughter, your faith has saved you. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Even the second half of that sentence, he says, Go in peace and... Be healed of your disease. So she got so much more than she bargained for. Not a mere physical healing, but the gift of faith that Jesus is the Son of God, the Lord of Israel. And now she believes. So Jesus takes the time in the midst of this urgency of someone who's way more important in the eyes of the crowd around them and probably his disciples as well, than this insignificant woman who has been ostracized for 12 years and in suffering. And yet Jesus stops and deals with her in the midst of probably the worst crisis of urgency in Jairus' life. Can you imagine what's going through his mind? I mean, if he had a watch, he'd be sitting there tapping his foot, looking at his watch, and like, I shouldn't say anything, but we really need to get going here, Jesus. And Jesus is, meanwhile, saying, who touched me? And talking to some random woman. And the text really denotes the sense of urgency quite nicely because right after Jesus says to this woman, daughter, your faith has saved you. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. The very next verse says, while he was still speaking. So while Jesus is talking to this woman, Jairus gets the news that his daughter has died. That's got to be frustrating He went out of his way to go find this Jesus guy. He humbled himself before him, implored him earnestly, but to no avail because Jesus wasn't urgent enough. What is Jesus thinking here? Why didn't he hurry? The text doesn't really give us any sort of sense that he couldn't have gone and healed the girl and come back and dealt with the woman. So what is going on here? Well, he did this for two reasons. First, 
Because, as we talked about, the woman wasn't merely healed, but given the gift of faith. And she didn't quite know what was happening. And so Jesus had to tell her. Imagine what it felt like to hear the words, daughter, when Jesus spoke that to this woman who's been ostracized and suffering and struggling. And now she knows that she's part of the family of God. Daughter, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Imagine the phrase, go in peace, for somebody who's been struggling for over a decade with all of the pain and suffering that she had been dealing with. In other words, Jesus' number one priority is your salvation. This woman's salvation was of more a priority for Jesus than the earthly death of a 12-year-old girl. You see, Jesus never has the same sense of urgency as Jairus does. But the second reason, and this kind of relates to the sermon text from last week with the calming of the storm, the second reason is that because Jesus is in complete control of every possible outcome that could come about in this scenario. What's the worst that could happen? No problem for Jesus. What's the worst that could happen? His daughter dies. Jesus can handle that. And he does. And then he utters this amazing statement. So while he's still speaking, Jairus, who's probably chewing his lip off at this point, gets the news from one of the people of his household that his daughter is dead. He's devastated, and, he's, and even the person in the house suggests, let's not bother the teacher any further. Clearly, he's just some dude who heals people. He can't do anything about death. And Jesus overhears what they're saying and says, do not fear, only believe. What a powerful statement for Jesus to say in that situation. Do not fear, only believe, not that your daughter is sick, but after you just found out she's dead, and Jesus says, do not fear, only believe. What do you think glorifies God more? What do you think is a witness about God's love more? The healing of a disease or the demonstration of authority over death? The demonstration of authority over the worst possible outcome of Jairus' sense of urgency. No problem for Jesus. Raising someone from the dead is what he came here to do. Now you may be able to relate to Jairus. I know I can. Maybe not with that extreme of a situation, but certainly that situation of urgency where you want everything to go quickly and by your own pace and God seems to be saying, it will come in time. You just have to wait. It'll happen when the time is right. Could you hold for a moment? You ever felt like that was the response to one of your prayers, almost to the point where you can hear the music that you're listening to while you're waiting for God to get back to you? It's a frustrating place to be. Because as part of our sinful nature, we like to be the ones in control. We like to be the one dictating the terms. And when we don't have control, that sense of urgency arises in us. And we want everybody else to feel the same. Just like Jairus tries to do here with Jesus. We implore him earnestly. Now, is that the wrong thing for him to do? Of course not. He should come to Jesus in earnest faith that he can take care of the problem that he's worried about. But the next time that occurs in your life, that sense of urgency, and you feel like God is not responding with quite the haste you would appreciate, ask yourself the question, well, what's the worst that can happen? Death? Jesus has conquered death. He has power over death. We learn in this text that death is the same as sleeping to Jesus. And we don't get that, right? When Jesus says that, the crowd laughs at him. 
What a ludicrous statement for a, a person to make. Well, Jesus is no mere person. He is the incarnate Son of God, the sovereign Lord of the universe. Death is defeated when it comes up against him. Perhaps you don't have a physical suffering or a loved one who's dealing with a terminal illness. Maybe you have a spiritual suffering. Maybe a loved one who doesn't believe or you're not sure if they still do. Or someone you're worried about because they've cut themselves off from the gifts of God and the body of Christ and are going it alone. This text is meant to be a comfort for that as well. Because Jesus stops and addresses the spiritual need of the woman above everything else. His priority is her understanding of the faith and salvation that she is now a daughter of God. That she is now a part of the family of God through the blood-bought sacrifice of Jesus. Salvation is our Lord's number one priority. Your salvation is our Lord's number one priority. He doesn't place any urgency over that, even the urgency of earthly death. So share the word with the person you're thinking of. Trust that God's word speaks to them. Pray for them earnestly and continually invite them to come to receive God's gifts at church, but all the while trusting that the Lord will take care of that in his time. Because despite our earnest imploring, just like Jairus, we can't quite instill the same sense of urgency in Jesus that we might feel in that situation. Because he's in control of every possible outcome. Now I know this doesn't fully alleviate your sense of frustration in that moment. And even after Jairus understood what was going on when Jesus tells his daughter, Talitha Kumi, and she gets up off of that bed, no wonder he wasn't in a hurry. He wasn't worried about what he was going to do when he got here. But still, when you're in that moment, we can all relate to Jairus. That sense of urgency, the worry, the anxiety... So what does this text help us to do? It helps us to trust in the Lord, even in these sorts of circumstances. Not that you can't be worried or anxious or even trying to earnestly implore the Lord. He wants you to do that. But trusting that he's in control of the situation, no matter the outcome, that even death has no hold over him. That he speaks and it flees. If things aren't happening the way that you want in the time that you want, God has something bigger and better in mind. Jairus was just hoping that Jesus would heal his daughter of an earthly ailment. And instead, what he did was demonstrate his power over death. Now we too know this about Jesus because he demonstrated his power over death for us as well. When he went to the cross. Notice that the power of Jesus on display here is even greater when the ailment or the weakness is greater. It's one thing to heal a decade of, of a flow of blood. Another thing entirely to raise someone from the dead. And it's the most miraculous thing in the history of everything. Everything. For a God to die for sinful people and grant them eternal life. And that's exactly what Jesus did on the cross. So what has Jesus done about your death? He died in your place. His death brought about victory over death forever and resurrection to all who believe. So, do not fear, only believe. In the name of Jesus. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, especially in those urgent and anxious circumstances, until he comes again to make everything new. Amen. Please rise. Having heard God's word, we now...